Hey everybody, and welcome back to Countdown by Deborah Wiles. Today we're going to be reading chapter 25, and at the end of this chapter there are some more primary resources, and I will show them to the camera, and you guys can uh, pause the video as you need to to get a look at those. So, All right, so when we last left Franny, she was with her family, and they were listening to President Kennedy's live address discussing the um, nuclear threat that is happening in Cuba. So um, you could tell by the map that they showed that those missiles could reach all the way across the United States of America. So things are pretty um, tense right now. Chapter 25. Everything has changed. I mean everything. President Kennedy's speech is all over the television and radio. Usually it's as quiet as the grave here in the morning, but this morning no one can get enough of the news. Daddy is still not home. Mom has the radio tuned up high enough in the kitchen to hear it through the noise of making breakfast. So much for not scaring the children. Go get your brother, Mom says to me. Yes, ma'am. And I troop downstairs and I can't help it. I'm pulled to the television news. I stand silently next to Uncle Otz, who sits in his chair smack in front of the television. He listens, changes the channel, listens and changes the channel again. The most ominous sign since the building of the Berlin Wall last summer says one news anchor. Khrushchev failed at seizing West Berlin, and now he is after bigger targets. Channel change. American U-2 reconnaissance flights over Cuba have shown that the buildup of missiles in Cuba over the summer has not, we repeat, not proven to be surface-to-air defensive missiles, but offensive weapons supplied by the Soviet Union that can fire nuclear warheads at American cities as far away as Montana. Channel change. As President Kennedy spoke to the nation last night, the American people were stunned to hear the breaking news that Soviet Russia has indeed armed nuclear warhead missile sites in Cuba, just 90 miles off the Florida coast, that can destroy United States cities within minutes. A presumed first strike would be Washington, D.C. I try to swallow, but instead I start coughing, which breaks Uncle Ott's concentration, and he wraps his long arm around my shoulders and says, Come here, private. Just right, not too hard, which would seem hysterical, and not too soft, which would seem uncaring. He hugs me with one of those, it will be all right, hugs. So I hug him back, not too hard, of course, but oh, it makes me feel better. Uncle Watts takes my shoulders in his big hands and gently pushes me away from him. I look him full in the face, asking questions I have no words for. He takes one finger and shoves my headband further up my head. That is all, he says, and I am restored for now. I knock on Drew's bedroom door. He doesn't answer. I open the door a crack. Drew? It's dark in his bedroom and it smells overwhelmingly like Old Spice. I step inside. Drew? Jack comes to greet me with one of Drew's shoes and I take it from him. No shoes, he chide him and he wags his tail. I'm not coming out, Drew says from under the covers. My nose crinkles at the old spice. Did Uncle Ott sleep in here? No, says Drew. And yes, says Uncle Ott from the next room. You have to come out, Drew. No, I don't. Believe me, when Mom has to come down here and get you, you'll come out. Drew scrambles the covers off his body using his feet and lies there like a corpse with no covers. We might have a real alert at school. This is Drew, who sails across the gravel pit on a flimsy rope, swings like nothing can hurt him. We might, I answer. And then I surprise myself and say, but I know what to do. I've always known what to do. What? If the real siren goes off, I'm going to run right to your classroom and get you. And we'll race for home. How's that? They'll never let us do that, says Drew. Well, they won't have a choice. I say, and it glides right off my tongue. If we're brave, they won't be able to stop us. Drew considers this. I'll meet you outside by the kickball field at the far end of the playground. Nope, I say. What if your teacher hangs on to you, or if there's a stampede and you fall and break your leg before you get there or something? I can go home without you. I'll run from my hallway to yours, and you be ready for me, okay? Then we'll run together. Drew sits up in bed. Promise? I promise. Now get dressed. I feel like such a smart big sister. I like it. 
Drew scratch, scratches his eyebrows while he thinks about what I've just told him. <sighs> Drew, look lively. Astronauts always get dressed. Franny, Drew, mom calls from upstairs. Coming, we chorus together. Here we go. I wear a soft blue headband that day. It's a stretchy circle and it won't pop off my head, but it doesn't hold my hair back as well. And sometimes it flops down onto my forehead. Sometimes it slips forward and bobs around my neck. If it's feeling real stretchy, I like it though. And today I need the softness. It's still pouring rain on this Tuesday morning. Thunder still grumbling in the distance. The sky is as gloomy as everyone's mood. How appropriate, says mom as she lights a cigarette, stuffs us in the car and drives us the two blocks down Allentown Road. Drew sits in the front and I don't even argue about it. He hugs mom as he gets out of the car, struggling with a hefty satchel, and he smiles. Mom turns to me in the back seat, gives me her listen to me very carefully look and says, look at me. I look her directly in the eyes. She blows that long, thin stream of cigarette smoke to the ceiling, then gives me her, you know what I'm talking about, look. Be good. Yes, ma'am. I give her the standard answer. You are better than that. Yes, ma'am. And I know this is my talking to for what happened yesterday in the bathroom with Margie. This is it. This is all. I don't even know mom anymore. Have a good day at school, Franny. And I don't budge. Mom? Yes. I love you. Mom smiles, a crooked smile. I love you too, Franny. Of course she does. She's my mom. She waves at me as I turn around the, in the door, getting soaked, and I wave back. This is an official civil, civil defense film. Oh, I guess I need to show you how this is written. So throughout this chapter, there are short little quips from what the children hear on the different broadcasts. I'll try my best to change my voice. When I get inside, Judy James smiles at me and I smile back. That's nice. I want to ask her if she watched President Kennedy's speech, but no one is talking about it. No one. So I don't either. In my classroom, I hang up my raincoat in the cloakroom, empty my satchel onto my desk and take my seat by the window. Kids straggle in, damp and solemn. I watch their faces as they get settled. Nobody stares at me like I'm a weirdo after what happened yesterday. They've all watched President Kennedy's speech, and they've got more important things on their mind. Denise Dubois says hi, and I say hi back. I wish I liked Denise more. I wish Mary Floods still went to school here at Camp Springs. Announcement. We all know the atomic bomb is very dangerous. Since it may be used against us, we must be ready for it. I sigh and open my assignment notebook and look at the rest of my week. I write everything down in my assignment book. Everything I do for the week. I even write down what I have for lunch every day. I like to see the week go by as I tick things off the list. And now I just hope I get another week on the planet. Before I can fill in French with... Madame Martin on Tuesday and music with Miss Farrell on Wednesday and Glee Club after school on Thursday, Mrs. Rodriguez steps smartly into class and claps her hands and announces that the entire fourth, fifth, and sixth grades will have an assembly program first thing this morning. Hmm. What a time for an assembly, but maybe that's good. It will take our minds off the Russians and their bombs in Cuba and we'll miss arithmetic too. Some kids clap and we start to feel like ourselves again. Hurry, boys and girls, says Mrs. Rodriguez. We've got to have all the students in the cafeteria by 9.15. Getting ready means we will all have to be able to take care of ourselves. The bomb might explode when there are no grown-ups near. I can't even say hello to Chris as he splashes in the in at the last minute. After the quickest prayer and pledge, I would like to... Sorry, my eye is itching. After the quickest prayer and pledge... I would like to enter our time in the Olympics. We troop single file to the cafeteria where folding chairs are smashed up next to one another. We're all crammed together like sardines in a can. It's raining so hard outside that we can hear the roar of the roof. Nope, we can hear the roar on the roof. <laughs> Let me read that sentence again. It's raining so hard outside we can hear the roar on the roof. Mrs. Rodriguez puts a hand on each of our shoulders as she rounds us to our aisles. Mrs. Sacker seats her class on the opposite side of the room. Margie is whispering to Marcy Weaver, and Mrs. Sacker shushes her with her nightmare shush. 
another announcement. Paul and Patty know this, and they are always ready to take care of themselves. Here they are on their way to school on a beautiful spring day. But no matter where they go or what they do, they always try to remember what to do if the atom bomb explodes right then. It's a bomb, duck and cover. Paul and Patty know what to do. I just want to chime in here. If you're interested in seeing any of these old civil defense messages, you can actually find them on YouTube or other websites. Um, they're, they're interesting. So. Somehow, I did not do a thing. Chris ends up sitting next to me in the assembly. He must have somehow figured out a way to sit next to me when we were lining up to walk down the hall in the cafeteria. Or maybe it was a mistake. Oh, I hope it wasn't a mistake. He gives me a quick smile of acknowledgement as he sits down. I give him a cool and composed nod, and I think, you did that very well, Franny. But in the next moment, all of my composure evaporates. Mr. Mitchell stands in front of us, clears his throat, and looks directly at me. N no, he doesn't, but it seems like it at first, and I look away immediately. I will never be able to look at Mr. Mitchell in the face again. But I can look at him from a distance, and I listen as he begins. Good morning, students and teachers. As many of you know, last night on television, President Kennedy spoke to the nation about the situation in Cuba. Everyone starts gabbling like chickens. We've been bursting to talk about this, but the teacher shush us all at once. We are now living in a true atomic age, Mr. Mitchell continues. He wipes a hand across his mouth. In an effort to make sure we are all informed and understand what to do in case of any irregularities, we are going to show all students and teachers at Camp Springs a civil defense film that covers all areas of public safety and shelter. Please pay close attention. After assembly, you will return to your classrooms where your teachers will be available for further discussion. Mr. Mitchell tugs at his tie uncomfortably. He has long forgotten my throwing up in his office. And I am off that hook forever. I look around and half expect to see Uncle Otz running the projector. He will be in his glory here. He's been warning all of us for months. The lights go down and up comes Bert the turtle. And like I said, if you're interested in seeing these civil defense films, that's what you would want to look up. Bert the turtle. Bert spelled like Bert and Ernie from Sesame Street. Bert the turtle on the screen at the front of the room. Bert wants us to duck and cover. He tells us to do exactly what the kids in his movie are doing. Ride your bikes, play with friends, have picnics with your family. Just be prepared, okay? Here's Tony going to his Cub Scout meeting. Tony knows the bomb can explode any time of the year, day or night. He is ready for it. Duck and cover. Attaboy, Tony. That flash means act fast. Tony knows that it helps to get any kind of cover. This wall was close by, so that's where he ducked and covered. I want you to think about that. Do you think ducking, like tucking your arms over your head up against a wall will protect you from a nuclear explosion? It's not good. If you are not close to home, when you hear that warning, go to the nearest safe cover. Know where you are to go or ask an older person to help you. Tony knew what to do. Notice how he keeps from moving or getting up and running. He stays down till it's over. He is sure he stays down until he is sure the danger is over. When the film sputters off and the lights go on, there's not a sound in the room, not even a chair scraping across the floor. We are all officially scared to death. Mr. Mitchell tells us that we will be going back to class now. His voice has found a no nonsense. I'm in charge, so everything will be fine tone, which I don't believe for one minute. Life will go on here at Camp Springs Elementary School, he says. Glee Club will meet after school on Thursday. We have a concert to prepare for. Safety patrols will report for duty daily. And on Friday, we have our annual Halloween parade. You may bring your costumes to school with you on Friday. It's going to be a great week here at Camp Springs School. Teachers, please dismiss your students. We've got the first through third graders waiting in the hallway. Even teachers seem stunned. Maybe they won't dismiss us. Maybe this moment is frozen in time and I can just sit here pretending Chris and I will know each other forever. That this, this jacket sleeve will always rest against my sweater sleeve like it does right now. And that I'll just be safe. My class, says Mrs. Rodriguez. And the spell is broken. We don't speak to one another. Those are the rules. 
As we file out of the auditorium in the hallway, we pass third grade and I give a, a thumbs up to Drew who looks so pale. I wonder if he slept at all last night. He gives me a wan smile. If I were mom and knew what Drew was about to watch, I'd write a note to Mr. Mitchell saying he isn't allowed to watch it. As we take our seats in the classroom, Mrs. Rodriguez doesn't talk about atomic bombs or ducking and covering. She paces in front of her desk back and forth with her head down while we all stare at her and wait for the next thing. And then she looks at the clock. Open your spelling books, boys and girls. I've got all the words memorized, of course, so I don't have to even look at my words. Mrs. Rodriguez is much more interesting. She doesn't sit down like she usually does as we go through our spelling words. She purses her lips and continues to pace. Denise Dubois spells friendship out loud and begins to use it in a sentence. Friendship, interrupts Mrs. Rodriguez. Put your spelling books away, boys and girls. Time for geography. And she pulls down the big map in front of the chalkboard. Everyone is confused, but no one makes a peep. This is where, sorry, my eyes are really itchy today. Mrs. Rodriguez takes her metal pointer out of her desk drawer, extends it so it's its longest length, and she slaps at the map just under the state of Florida. This, she says, and we all look at where the red tip has landed, is Cuba. We stare at Cuba. We look at how close it is to the United States of America, and we talk not about bombs or Russians, but about Cuba and Cubans. My husband is from Cuba says Mrs. Rodriguez. Kids suck in their breaths and lean forward in their seats. He is a teacher in a college near here. He immigrated to America 20 years ago, and that's when I met him. Before I married him, my name was Miss Albergetti, Gina Albergetti. We stare at Miss Gina Albergetti, who became Miss Gina Rodriguez. No one knows what to say, but that's fine because Miss Miss, Miss Rodriguez has plenty to say. Cuba is an archipelago of islands in the Caribbean Sea, says Mrs. Rodriguez. Ar archipelago is one of your word wealth junior bonus words this week. Look it up if you haven't. Since I memorized the definitions of each spelling word, I know that an archipelago is a chain or cluster of islands, usually in the open sea that are formed by erupting undersea volcanoes. Jimmy Epps raises his hand. Have you been there? I have many times, says Mrs. Rodriguez to visit my husband's family. But we have not been there since the Cuban revolution started six years ago. She retracts her pointer, comes to the front of her desk and leans against it. Cuba is a beautiful country full of beautiful people. Let me tell you about it. We skip spelling and reading and I begin to hope we'll skip social studies this afternoon. Who needs to read about the explorers when we've got one right here in our room? The rain pours down like a monsoon, and we listen to Mrs. Rodriguez tell us stories through the gloom that's outside. Stories about beaches and mountains, music, food, tobacco fields, the city of old Havana, and the, the stories of her beautiful Cuban family. She plays the mambo for us on the record player on her desk. She dances the cha-cha. We giggle in our seats until she makes us stand up and cha-cha at our desks with her. We laugh so hard, our sides hurt. When the bell rings for lunch, kids actually groan. And Mrs. Rodriguez has tears in her eyes. She pulls her handkerchief out of her pocket, dabs at her eyes and her nose and says very quietly and resolutely, I love my husband's country. I love Cuba. And I have started to love it too. How can I be scared of such a beautiful country full of beautiful people who are related to my teacher? I am weary of worrying and maybe, just maybe, I don't have to. Mrs. Rodriguez says, you are dismissed for lunch. Remember, there will be indoor recess. Kids make all kinds of noise as they get their lunches and lunch money out of their cloakroom and Mrs. Rodriguez doesn't shush them. I open my assignment book and then write. Cuba on Tuesday morning. I telegraphed Mrs. Rodriguez. There must have been a reason you skipped me three times, but I forgive you. And then it's time for lunch. 
So that is the end of the chapter, but there are some primary sources that I do want to share with you. Remember to pause the video. And I want to remind you, um, East Jackson kiddos, that you have a beautiful, wonderful friend in our school who um, her family and she is from Cuba and it is a beautiful, wonderful country. So ready? Remember to pause if you want to see them more closely. I will do my best to hold it still. The song. I'm sure some of you probably recognize the couple on this page Desi Arnaz and Lucille Ball. If you don't know who Lucille Ball is, then you need to watch I Love Lucy. I know I'm going fast, but you can come back and pause so you can read those. And that is the end of the primary sources. Thank you so much. That was a longer chapter, but I really want to get through this book with you guys. Um, I love you all. Work hard, make good choices, and I will see you guys later. Bye.